first of all, congratulations to everybody to make it to 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Um, there's a, a quote from, a bloke, um, the, from Gregory Zinoviev, who was the president of the Communist International. Um, there's the mark. Oh. Uh. Again, uh, who, who, um, and what he said in, in, in the autumn of 1923 was that the German events are developing with an extrable fate the path which he took in the Russian Revolution 12 years to cover from 1906 to 1917 would have taken the German Revolution five years from 1918 to 1923. The proletarian revolution is knocking at Germany's door. You would have to be blind not to see it. Very soon, everyone will see that the autumn of 1923 is a turning point, not just for the history of Germany, but for the history of the whole world. Now, obviously, sadly, um, Gregory Zinoviev was wrong. Right, stuff about the, the, the turning point of 1923. And there were massive repercussions of, of the failure of the German Revolution to reach a successful conclusion. On the one hand, if you read reports of what it was like in Russia in, 19, in, in the summer and, and the early autumn of 1923, a country that had been ravaged by civil war, that was being ravaged by a faction fight inside the, 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 the Communist Party and stuff that, that was really heading towards the development of Stalinism and the defeat of the revolution, actually what you get a fl is a flowering in Russia of enthusiasm for revolutionary ideas and the rest of it. Within a year of that, 1924, you get Stalinism and the begins of Stalinism and a declaration of socialism in one country. The failure of the German Revolution is not just obviously a matter for Germany, but within 10 years, you have the rise of Hitler, the Second World War, and the rest of it. This was a high stakes event. Right stuff that was 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 happening inside Germany in in, in the wake of the of the first of the first World War, and its repercussions were felt for ge for generations. The second thing about the German Revolution is that for me, for many many people, really, it's something we don't talk. People have never heard of, to be quite frank about it and stuff. It's not something we're, we're educated about at school or, or 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 come across whatever. And actually. Many, many of the strategy and tactics that we talk about, about the idea of, of a united front, right stuff, the idea, analysis of reformism, right stuff, how revolutionaries work alongside reformist workers and the rest of it. All these ideas were played out during, during the German Revolution at a very, very high level. And it's not just the, the action of the revolution, but the theoretical debates that, it, that, that it, it developed weren't just about Germany, but were felt right across the world, particularly through, through the prism of the Communist International, the third international that had been set up by the Bolsheviks following the revolution in, in, in inside Russia. And so this was a, a tumultuous series of events. The November... the the, the revolution begins in, in, in late October, beginning of November 1918. And what, what, the, what happens really is, is the biggest blow, the final blow again, against the First World War. People know that from 1914 to 1918, there had been the biggest bloodletting in human history going on, right? So, uh, uh, around it, uh, 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 centered on Europe, but it was a global conflict and stuff. And obviously, Germany had been at the very center of, 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 that, co of that conflict. And for years, there are huge casualties, huge suffering from working class people, right, stuff, ground resistance, and in, uh, at the, uh, uh, in, in November 1918, um, as the German army is effectively collapsing, the, naval, the German naval commanders decide they're going to go out on one last big battle, right, one last attempt to take on the Royal Navy and, um, show, and finally sa salvage the honour of the German military. Sensibly, German sailors don't really fancy this one, right, stuff over it, and so their response to this is to douse the boilers in the battleships arrest the officers, seize the battleships themselves whatever, uh, over it. And because they'd been involved in previous actions where their leaders had been shot or imprisoned and the rest of it, they realised that as soon as you take on the state, you better be serious about it. So the sailors start sending out delegations across the north of, of Germany. They start spreading the revolution to cities like Hamburg and whatever. And what you get is a huge rising, beginning a, wave, a tidal wave that breaks out across Germany, the setting up of workers' councils, right, and stuff, and, and the rest of it, on the model of what had happened in Russia in, 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 in 1917. An absolutely incredible moment. Don't let anybody tell you that the First World War War ended because a few generals had seen sense or a few politicians had seen sense. It, it ended because the soldiers and the sailors and the people in, the, in, in Germany and other countries were refusing to fight and refusing to carry on paying the price. The war itself had begun in, in August 1914 with perhaps the greatest kind of um, um, schism inside the workers' movement that had ever been seen. Right stuff over it. The main working class organisation inside Germany was the SPD, the Labour Party in Germany, the Social Democratic Party. This was an incredible organisation that had millions of voters, hundreds of thousands of members, right stuff. Everything from psycho. Oh, fucking Jesus. Mate. <laughs> 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 
everything from cycling clubs to you know national newspapers, local newspapers, rambling associations and all the rest of it. And this wasn't just an ordinary Labour Party. This was a party that said it was linked to Karl Marx, to Frederick Engels, it said it was a revolutionary socialist organisation and it was absolutely pledged to end the idea of war through the idea of strike action and opposition to the war. Everybody believed that this is what the SPD would do in the case of war. It was pledged to do so through the international, the second international that brought together all the different socialist organisations. Now there had been rows inside the SPD previously. It wasn't the case, there wasn't an argument going on. People like Rosa Luxemburg, the Polish German revolutionary as a young, as a young woman identified the problems inside the SPD amongst other people, the growth of reformism. <laughs> It was year after year, quite often it wasn't about the, the struggle in the workplaces or the revolutionary struggle, quite often it was parliamentary elections, council elections, day to day work inside the trade unions, building up the SPD's membership etc etc and what, she did, what, what her and other people identified was a, a growing reformist covenant current, revisionist current around people like Bernstein and other, 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 other people. So people knew there were problems inside the SPD, but predominantly this was seen as a party that was going to fight war and going to fight ca 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 capitalism. Karl Kautsky, right, stuff who becomes, you know, who at one point turns up in one of Lenin's pamphlets as the renegade Kautsky, is seen at one stage as the Pope of Marxism. These are the absolute cream of the cream, right, stuff over it. And the Bolsheviks and other people look to the SPD as a model of what a revolutionary Socialist Party should be. When war breaks out, they utterly capitulate, despite the fact that within days previously there had been mass demonstrations <coughs> against the war, that the SPD had been organising uh, uh, been organising, and the rest of it. They end up saying, saying that they had to sign with their own ruling class against Russian militarism, against etc, etc. Et and this does come as a massive shock to, 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 to the movement, both inside Germany, famously Rosa Luxemburg sends out letters to leftists to say, look, we've got to put a halt to this. She sends out 300 letters and gets a handful of replies. Now, the, the most, you know, when, um, when, when Lenin sees the front page of the, paper, of the, paper, of the SPD's paper, Vorwitz, he believes it's been made up. He thinks it's, it's been, you know, it's, it's a fake. Right, so this can't be true and stuff over it. So the SPD had, 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 had and that basis had supported the war. And actually, despite the fact that the whole international was committed to the idea of general strikes and, and agitation against the war and the rest of it. Only a handful of parties right, and stuff oppose the war in, in Bulgaria, the Bolsheviks in Russia, in, in, in Italy and, 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 other, and other places and stuff. And so in 1914 it seemed really that, that a cataclysm has happened and maybe you can't recover from this kind of cataclysm. But the movement does begin to recover. By 1915 internationally you get the Zimmer World Conference bringing together anti-war activists and, 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 and revolutionaries and inside, and inside Germany opposition begins to crystallise as well. Famously, Karl Liebknecht, he doesn't vote against the war credits the first time round, he sticks with party discipline, but the second, in the second vote <coughs> in the Reichstag, he sticks his hand up against um, voting for the war, war credits and, and for, for, for his pleasure and other ad, ad, uh, activities. Him, Rosa Luxemburg, and other people are imprisoned. Right and stuff for their anti-war starts. But the working class in Germany begins to rebel. In 1916 there were strikes in engineering in support of Karl Liebknecht for his release and the rest of it. And by the beginning of 1918 you have a big, big strike movement developing into who oh, yeah. Yeah. Knows, right? so, uh, um, a big, big strike movement de developing in, in, inside Germany, which culminates in the, in a, in a, the November crisis. And the, and, and the Kaiser, just like the Tsar before him, this you know, where Kaiser actually does a better job. He gets away, he scuttles away to, to Holland, doesn't get taken out and stuff. But this is an incredible movement. At this stage, the ruling class in Germany are absolutely terrified. A year before, and they see the Bolsheviks seize power. They now have workers' councils. They have soldiers marching through the middle of Berlin, carrying red flags and, and you know, setting up machine gun posts right, and stuff. This is real serious shit. And so who do they turn to to save them in this situation? They turn to the SPD. They turn to the leaders of the main Labour Party and under this basis they say, you guys, you've got to come in, you have to save the nation. It, even months before and they've been trying to cut you know, democracy inside, to effectively a military dictatorship inside Germany, but they turn to the SP leaders to save them. And because the SPD has identified with defending their own state in the war, they now identify with defending their own state against the threat, the, the threat of the, the, against the threat of, of, of revolution. And, and 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 leaders like Ebert and Nosk and Scheidman 
leaders of the SPD ba basically um, uh, 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 take part and support the formation of organisations called the Free Corps. The Free Corps, as the, German, as the German army collapses, what they do is organise paramilitary groups that are going to take on these revolutionaries that are out in the streets and stuff over it. They help to arm them and, 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 they, help, um, and, they, and they help to organise them. During the war, the Labour movement itself had split. The SPD had split between a, a large minority, right stuff, who were anti-war in various ways. They include Rosa Luxemburg and revolutionaries. They also include reformists, uh, reformists like Kautsky and, and, and other people and stuff over it. And, and they'd formed the USPD, the Independent Party. This party brings together really all the radical elements of workers in, in, inside Germany. But, uh, but as the, the crisis develops, that it, 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 its leaders are asked to join the, go the, uh, the government. They are asked to join the government as well. Now, in the midst of all this, Luxembourg and Liebknecht are released from prison. Um, what they have around them is a loose network, really, of revolutionaries under a banner of the Spartacist League, right, and stuff. You know, we, it's not a huge grouping and stuff around. It's people who have been both in the SPD, then gone on to the USPD and stuff, and, and, they, and they come out... Onto, onto the sh uh, uh, in, in the middle of uh, 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 tumultuous events and stuff. Karl Liebknecht himself is a very, very famous individual. People have gone out and striked for Liebknecht. They've supported Liebknecht. He's been the symbol of those that wanted to oppose the war. And on the 20th and 21st of December, what Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht try to do is pull together the revolutionary elements into one organisation. They break with the, they've broken with the USPD that's gone into government, right and stuff over. They now want to form a communist party. The K they call it K KPDS, the KPD Spartacists, and stuff around it, and they have their initial conference. But there's a massive problem with the initial conference, and there's a couple of couple of things to say. First of all, the conception of a revolutionary organisation, you know, Luxembourg, Lenin, etc., etc., and stuff, have wanted to see revolution, whatever. But actually, Luxembourg and other people have always worried about the idea of breaking from the mainstream, mainstream left parties because they believe that it would isolate them. Not because they're against organising as revolutionaries, but they don't want to be isolated from the masses. And also, they have a worry about the idea of the Bolshevik-style organisation. They see it as top-down. And partly they see it as top-down in a way because that a kind of bureaucratic centralist process is what had happened inside the SPD and for lots of militants inside Ger Germany, the idea of centralism, the idea of order, organisation, etc., etc., sounds too much like the old party. It sounds like what I've just broken from and stuff about. So that's a big thing to take on. The second thing is the delegates that go to the conference are mainly young workers, young soldiers, and the idea that we're going to carry out a long, torturous struggle to win the working class, well, I'm sorry, fuck that. We're going to try and seize power. That's what the argument is inside inside the meeting and you think that because you're just back from the trenches you have a gun in your hand you've seen the soviets and the idea that we're going into parliamentary elections or work inside the trade unions all these kind of things and the trade unions that have just sold us out isn't it parliament that's just sold us out so despite the fact that luxembourg Liebnik, paul levy and other people put very sensible arguments about how to start winning the majority of the working class towards um, towards the communists and stuff about it, they lose the votes inside the meeting. They lose the votes. And what it means is a whole number of very serious revolutionary working class militants in Berlin and elsewhere refuse to join the new communist party. These people look like putches to me. They look like people who want to seize power without the majority and stuff about it. Rosa, Carl, you're wonderful people, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm staying with the independents for now and we'll see how things go. And things move so rapidly, it's not the fact that they get months after month to deal with this. In January 19... 1919, just a few weeks after the Congress, the government carries out a provocation inside Berlin. It wants to force the German workers onto the streets before they're ready to, to, the, before they're ready to take on the government. So they sack a police chief in Berlin who's been in office since the November, November coup. Uh, the November Revolution, sorry, workers come out onto the streets, barricades go up, a general strike is called around it, and Karl Liebknecht, who's a man who was quite excitable in many ways, for good reasons, signs up a, a, a call with other leftists in the cities to overthrow the government, without any discussion with his own party or whatever, w with it and stuff over it. The, the, the rising inside Berlin is isolated geographically and stuff, the Free Corps, the military forces go in, and they smash it, and they also, within that, take out Rosa Luxemburg, take Karl Liebknecht, and kill the both of them. And actually one of the things that you, you, find, you find there is continually the leadership, anybody who ever talks about the leadership of revolutionary organisations and normally it is a quick path to death or problems really and stuff around it. It certainly was in, 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 in Germany at that time. But it's a massive blow 
for the young organisation to lose somebody like, like like Rosa Luxemburg. She's a you know internationally renowned theoretician. She's a leading figure in the whole workers' movement. She's somebody who's completely on a par with Lenin, Trotsky, all the rest of them stuff around it. Liebknecht is one of the most is probably the most re famous revolutionary socialist internationally because of the position, and 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 and, and, and he's dead. The defeat in, in Berlin doesn't stop the movement. Actually, what it does is it spreads the movement to other, to, to other areas in the, rural, uh, uh, in, in the rural and elsewhere and stuff. There are massive strikes, clashes with the army. In Bremen and, 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 and Saxony, workers join a, a, a strike movement and clash with the Free Corps. And in, in, in March, in Bavaria, in the south of Germany, there is a kind of bizarre process that goes from a, a Soviet republic is called, it's kind of made up of sort of, uh, it's first of all um, identified by the communists as what they describe as a pseudo-Soviet republic. It isn't really based on workers' councils, etc., etc. Uh, it, it falls and the communist party finds itself arguing to take defence of the position. They hold the Soviet Republic right, suffer a f uh, for a brief period of time and, 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 then, and then they're smashed. So you have a situation where what's happening is in different parts of Germany at different times because there is no centralised revolutionary leadership, workers rise up, the Free Corps come in, they, they behead the movement, so workers rise up in the next part of Germany, the Free Corps move on. So at no point does the German state fa face a one big punch by everybody. What they face is a series of, of, of insurrections that they can deal with. By, March, by, by the end of March 19, 1920, the generals really think they've had enough. They've gone through an experience of, 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 um, of the SPD in government. They've gone through a series of insurrections. They've smashed up lots of the revolutionary movement, and now they think that they can now they think that they can take the whole process on and get rid of the democracy for good. So they carry out a putsch, a, a, mili a military putsch um, under the, 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 the head of a, a government of, of a civil servant called Cap and stuff ab uh, about it. They take over the government in Berlin. The SPD leaders panic completely, but one man, um, uh, one man, a guy, he's a called Carl Egan, a long-standing trade union bureaucrat, doesn't panic. Right stuff. He decides that actually everything's at stake now, and he calls the general strike. The general strike is an absolutely massive success. The country is paralysed, and in areas again like central Germany, like, Sa like Saxony and the rural as well, the armed workers smash the, the, smash the army basically and stuff in pitched battles right, and stuff b b between them. Absolutely huge level of struggle. And once again, the workers' councils appear across Germany right, and stuff, and it seems there's a there's a massive opportunity at this stage. At this stage, um, uh, Legan calls for a workers' government. In other words, to do the sort of thing that was called by the Bolsheviks before October 1917. Let's get rid of the capitalists out of the government. Let's have the left, the, the SPD and the USPD in government. Let's get the communists into the government, etc., etc. Now, to, be, to begin with, the Communist Party doesn't even doesn't even support the movement to defend the government. Uh, why, why bother defending them and stuff over it? They've just done us over effectively and stuff over it. But it's drawn in, into into the movement, and for millions of workers. For the first time, really, during this process, they start seeing that you can't just rely on the parliamentary majority. Because we had the parliamentary majority. When the military tried to take over, they ran away. The only answer to this and stuff was, was the trade unions, the general strike, and the rest of it. And by the way, the Communist Party wasn't bad after a while. They caught up. They started to lead things. And this is a huge, huge step forward. At this stage, the, the, the KPD is led by a man called Paul Levy. Paul Levy is a... a personal associate of, of, of Rosa Luxemburg. He's somebody who has a very patchy history inside the, the, the communist movement. It, uh, but, but actually, in, in this position, he, try, he tries to put tries to take up again the arguments that, that um, Luxemburg and others have put previously. First of all, he says we have to counter putschism. Right stuff. We can't have the idea that workers, that the Communist Party will seize power on behalf of the working class. We're against this rubbish. Right stuff. We don't believe that a minority can take power, and even if they can take power, they can't hold it. We have to win the majority of the working class, and so therefore he's prepared to say hard things. For example, about about the Bavarian Soviet Republic, he said, "Come on, it was a joke." Right stuff. We were forced into a position we should never have been forced into. It doesn't make him popular either inside his own party or inside the com the Communist. Interna inter inter international. The second thing is he tries to take up the call 
for a workers' government. He said, it's a good idea to have a workers' government. We'd like to see it, just like the Bolsheviks argue for a government without the 10 capitalist ministers. We'd like to see this thing, right? Stuff. And even we would be prepared, in the same kind of language that Lenin used in, in 1917, to be a loyal opposition to such a government and stuff. This causes huge rows inside the KPD itself, from the left inside the KPD, and also in, 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 in internationally. But he's supported on some of these positions by Lenin and people inside, in, inside the Third International. The other thing he does is move to expel what he describes as the ultra-lefts. These are people who are often quite, uh, are quite good people. They're quite good people, but they cannot stand the idea of, of trying to win the minority. They want action now, 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 now. And, what, and that's what happens in, in Bavaria, that's what had happened in Berlin, and he expels a whole number of, of, of individuals and branches inside the KPD and stuff who are not prepared to go along to a new line of winning the mass masses. A new party is set up, the KAPD, right, and stuff, which, which, uh, the revolutionary com sort of communist um, pa 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 party in Germany and stuff, stuff over it. This argument is something that again causes massive arguments inside the international. People like Lenin and others believe this is a mistake. He's trying to push out the most revolutionary, uh, 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 most revolutionary elements. Uh, uh, and, and the rest of it. Most importantly, what what Levy does, and also with Karl Radak, who's, who's the, the the kind of emissary from the Third International inside Germany, is they work very very hard to 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 get to win unity with the left of the independents, with the USPD, with the revolutionary workers who had not joined the KPD at its formation. They work really bloody hard to do this. Part of the reason why they expel the left is to try to pull in what they see as the real left, the real revolutionary workers in, in, inside, in, in, inside, in, inside the German workers' movement. And they're able to win this in October, in December, uh, sorry, in, at the end of, um, 19, no, at the end of 1920, there's a famous conference and stuff of the USPD's membership. Zinoviev, the, one of the Russian leaders, goes to the meeting to put the case for the Communist International, why the USPD should affiliate to the Communist International, why they need to unite with the Communists inside Germany. He makes a three-hour speech. You'll be glad to know none of us are going to do that today and stuff over it. And they win. They win the majority of it and they sign up to what's called the 21 Conditions. The 21 Conditions is an attempt to make sure that any party that joins the Third International has to sign up to be a real revolutionary party. It's trying to do the kind of camel through the eye of a, of a needle stuff but they win the majority the, the, they win the majority to this and what you've then got when the merger happens is a party of half a million german workers in a revolutionary organization the united communist party of germany and the first initiative that they take under levy's leadership is an open letter it's an open letter to other revolu to other working class organizations to say look we might disagree on the idea of a soviet republic we may disagree on that you may think parliament's away but surely we can unite to defend workers wages surely we can unite to disarm the the, the, the military and the right wing gang surely we can ha have some kind of unity this is a really serious initiative really and stuff and, and again is one that is explored inside the communist international one what levy and people's uh, 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 tactics are based on the idea that the initial revolutionary wave has ebbed inside europe and therefore the communists have to think about how do we win the majority of workers to our position even if it's not within days even if it's o over peri pe periods of years at this stage there is, a, and as it usually is if you read about it, a massive internal crisis inside the KPD. Paul Levy is seen as a right winger. He's, see, he's seen as somebody who's selling the past. He's, put, he's, he's putting the path back to democracy. He's also involved in a big argument in the international about the splitting of the, of the Socialist Party in, inside Italy. There's a, he, he loses key votes in the leadership body to the left and Levy walks off. Levy would decide that he's going to resign his position as leader of the, of the organisation and the rest of it and stuff over it. This is a huge, huge mistake. Because here you've got a party with 500,000 people, but you've got a party of 500,000 people in a very serious international situation. If you're in Russia and you're somebody like Gregory Zinoviev, the man who is in, in the head of, of the Communist International, Russia, is in cri in Russia the, the movement is in crisis. They're just about to have introduced a new economic policy. In other words, a retreat inside Russia to the idea of allowing some elements of capitalism to come back inside of the, the, the economy. And, and, and the, the international is looking at the German Communist Party and thinking, for God's sake, do something. We're hanging on here. We're sitting here taking pandings all over the place. There are half a million of you while you're going on about United Front and winning the masses, right? And stuff. It's about time you took action. They sent a man called Bella Kuhn 
who was the leader of the, of the, so the briefly, brief, brief Soviet Republic in Hungary, to Germany. And there's all sorts of mystery about what kind of mission that Kuhn is on for the, for the common term. But basically, he goes along and argues to activate the German Communist Party. Stop all this pissing around about, mis about, about winning the majority. There's half a million of you. Get cracking. And so what they do is they initiate in March 1921 what is called the March Action. In other words, the communists decide that they want to force the pace of the revolution. They want to carry out what is called the theory of the offensive, that if you've got a communist party, act like a communist, go on strike, carry out the insurrection, do it, do it now. And what happens in a situation where the majority of workers in Germany aren't ready to go on to the offensive at that stage is a complete and utter debacle. You get the communist party calling for a general strike, which is only partially supported even by its own membership. You get situations where unemployed workers are told to pick it out, employed workers at the gate. You even get a situation where in some areas there are plans for the communist party to blow up its own offices in order to make workers angry enough to come out on strike. It's a complete and utter mess. And at this stage, the, the new party, which has been tortuously constructed to half a million people, hemorrhages half its membership. For many workers, people cannot understand what the communists are up to. It seems that all the putschism, all the idea of seizing power with a minority that they said they weren't going to do, doing 1920 is exactly what they're doing by 1921. And again, this causes a massive row inside the international communist movement. Paul Levy, who is still, a mem who still, are still on the leading bodies of, 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 of the KPD, argues that this is a complete debacle and publishes a pamphlet publicly out there in the open in front of everybody, blaming the Communist International for its intervention, blaming the Communist Party leadership over it and saying this is, you know, that effectively this shows that the, the KPD is nowhere near being the revolutionary party that it should be. He's supported politically by people like Clara Zetkin and other people leading communists inside the party, but also internationally, people like Lenin and Trotsky and other people can see that what he's saying is right. The problem with what Levy does is he attacks the party publicly at a time when it is being hammered in the press, it's members are being arrested, its members are being shot and beaten and the rest of it. And so forth. there's a, a, a terrible reaction to Levy's pamphlet. Anybody who's ever been in an SWP branch meeting when we fuck something up, when you haven't been there on the Saturday and tell everybody how they got it wrong, who knows what this would be like, <laughs> right, stuff like, over it and stuff. And this is exactly what Levy does. Levy's expelled from the Communist International under the basis of breaking discipline. And it's a tragedy, really, because Levy had a lot to give to the workers' movement. Lenin, and, and tr well, Lenin talks about Levy, he said Len Levy may have lost his head but at least he had a head to lose, right, and stuff over it. But Levy and his supporters end up back in, inside, in, inside the SPD, inside the SPD with, within months. And he, what he argues is that that's it. Shows the Communist International is finished. It shows that the KPD is finished. We have to start thinking about a new strategy. The problem is Levy's wrong. Right stuff around it, because actually the Communist International is able to debate and discuss what had went wrong inside, in, inside, inside Germany, and in many ways come out in support of the exact ideas that Livy has put forward about the attempt to build the United Front, about the attempt to build up support around the Communists, support the idea of the open letter type strategy, and, 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 and the rest of it. And the, and the KPD itself is going to get, it, it, it's going to get its, 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 its final chance. How am I doing for time? Oh, fucking hell. Five minutes. Well, that's going to be a miracle. That's going to be a miracle, right? So for, uh, over it. The, 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 man, the, the, man who the man who takes on the leadership of, of the German Communist Party is, is, a, is a guy named Brandler. Brandler was a building worker, and he had built up the Communist Party inside his own his own uh, his own city, Chemnitz, right? Stuff in in Saxony into a mass organisation. What, what Brandler really is, 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 is he, he's the man who takes over from Levy. He's the one who carries out the march action, right? Stuff over it, stuff in a, in a whole wave of the thing. Brandler sits back with others afterwards and said, that was nuts. That was absolutely nuts. And we are never going to do that again. Never, never, never. And so what Brandler really is, is he becomes the right inside, I, I, what that's seen as the right inside the German, co the, co German, German Communist Party. And the whole strategy is to rebuild the United Front, to work in the emerging factory council movement stuff. Factory councils begin as a kind of joint thing inside the factories with employers and the rest of it. Increasingly, as the economic crisis bites inside Germany, these things begin to take on kind of more and more elements of workers' control and workers' power and actually start to begin to play the role that the Soviets played in, 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 inside, in, inside, of, in, inside of, of Russia. In January 1923, there's already 
massive inflation inside Germany, but the French army and the Belgian army go back into Germany to get the reparations they want from the First World War, and they occupy the Ruhr. And this creates a most enormous political and economic crisis that probably any major capitalist country has ever seen. Right, and stuff around it. First of all, there's, I mean, you know, huge hunger, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's this hyperinflation, and people, it's, it's, they're caricatures of this, but literally, people are paid at 11 o'clock in a factory. They then run out to spend the money by 12 o'clock, right, and stuff over it. There are, there are people are being paid twice a day. Literally, at one stage, there are photographs of people using wheelbarrows to take the money. The presses can't keep up anymore at one stage about it, and the, and the big capitalist employers are using it and stoking the inflation because they believe this helps them cut their debt as well because you pay, pay back on the basis of what you owed a few months ago. Hey, you know, it's worth it. So the whole thing becomes this incredible cycle. The government calls what it describes as passive resistance to the occupation in the rural. There are strikes, protests, the French army are brutal to the population. There's nationalist agitation inside, inside the rural. People saying you can't talk about it. There being class problems inside Germany anymore. We're all part of one proletarian nation. We're under occupation by, 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 by the Allies and the rest of it. An incredible, incredible situation. And although there are a mass series of strikes, strikes don't seem to be enough anymore. Because if you go on strike, you're going to strike for more money, but more money doesn't mean anything anymore. If you're middle class for the first time, if you're a middle class person, you've saved money over years, your money's worth nothing. Within moments, everybody is completely, completely desperate. And the, the, the differences inside the working class, I mean, one of the explanations for the sellout of the SPD from the Third International, from people like Carl Raddock and other people, was there was a kind of, you know, a kind of upper layer inside the working, cl working class that had been bought off, right, and stuff like, uh, over it and the rest of it. Actually, nobody was bought off by 1923. Nobody had any cash. Everybody was desperate. And in this situation, you've got a, a, a development of the extreme right around Hitler and the NSDP uh, AP and other people in Bavaria in the wake of the fall of the Soviet Republic. And you've also got a feeling that Something has to be done, but uh, something has to be done by, by the communist by the communist party. And what the communist put is do is a couple of things. First of all, they build up the the, it, the initiatives inside the factory councils. Secondly, they build up organisations called the proletarian hundreds, and the proletarian hundreds are going to defend the working class and the fascists and the military. They're not just KPD organisations. They're not just communists. They involve thousands and thousands and thousands of SPD members, and increasingly, as the SPD involved in government and the rest of it can't can't deliver people are beginning to look to the to the communists to do something uh, to do something uh, uh, about this, this this situation at the end of july um Nine, uh, in July 1923, the Communist Party under Brandler calls for an anti-fascist day of action. It's going to march out on the streets to try to do something about the far right and stuff about it. This c creates panic, really, in the government, but panic inside the organisation as well. Lots of people who see themselves as lefts or right-wing inside the organisation think this going on to the offensive business is nuts because we just messed up in 1921. Why are we doing it again? Why are we starting to push our weight around again? And the Communist Party pulls back. Within a few days, however, though, with at the country absolutely collapsing under the weight of, eco of e an economic crisis, the, the government under a man called Kuno, right, stuff, a general strike breaks out, not called by the trade unions because they wobble, called by the factory councils under the domination of the Communist Party, they call a general strike and they smash the government. The government falls they, they, in a list stage and stuff, an absolutely incredible well, uh, industrial action, strikes, clash arm clashes on the streets and, and, the, and the rest of it. When the government falls, there is a lull. People think, I came out to get rid of Kuno, he's gone. Well, he's gone. What do we do next? And at this stage, right, stuff over, over this huge wave of struggle with a whole year being put in the basis that actually we're on the defensive, build the United Front, build the United Front, the communists and internationally begin to no notice, my God, this is a revolutionary crisis going on and stuff about it. Aren't we here to try to seize power in this sort of situation? And so at this stage, really on slightly on the ebb of the movement, the communists, both internationally and inside Germany, begin to make preparations to seize power. Right, stuff over it. And they, and they work out a plan in order to do this. All the time, they've been agitating for the idea of a workers' government. Like I said, at the end of the Kuno strikes, the strikes against them, there isn't a workers' government. There's this thing called a grand coalition, the SPD going with the Tories, everybody else and the rest of it. So they now decide they're going to keep agitating around this issue, but in two places in Germany, in Saxony and Thuringia, where there are left governments, they're going to enter the government. There's a huge row about this, as obviously would be if one of anybody in this room became a government minister suddenly in a Corbyn government or any anything else right, stuff, uh, stuff around it. But they argue they're entering the government in order to make preparations for the insurrection, to get into government, to try and find arm stashes, to try and prepare the workers to do it. And there is a huge, huge preparation 
um, in the Communist Party to organise militarily to get ready to seize power. They even set the date eventually to seize power. There's some discussion about Trotsky coming to Germany to lead the insurrection uh, and the rest of it. But the basic plan is this. The left is strong in Saxony. We know the army are going to move into Saxony because that's where the Communist Party are part of the government. Right? So when they move in, we are going to argue for the general strike, we're going to call for support, and we're going to seize power. Plan ready. Everybody's away. Secret cells are all set up all over the country. People stashing arms. People staying up till 3 o'clock in the morning, working out the military plan. Right? So everything comes to a culmination of a meeting in late October in Chemnitz. This is the place where Brandler's base is. This is the place where everybody loves Brandler. And he walks into the room, and he said there are... There are supporters from the left government there, there are trade unionists there, there are KPD members there, and he says, we've got to call the general strike. And he thinks he's going to win it. He thinks he's going to win it, and he thinks the left inside the SPD are going to back him. And they don't. They don't. They wobble in the room. Maybe you're right, Brandler. Maybe you're wrong. We're not quite sure. Are the military going to come into Saxony, really? Maybe they're just going to deal with the far right in Bavaria and the rest of it. And actually, he loses the vote in the room, and what they, what, at that moment, they lose their nerve. They absolutely lose their nerve. Right stuff about it, and they begin uh, they begin to retreat. The insurrection's called off. One place in the in, in the country in Hamburg doesn't get the orders. So so the, the communists go out into the streets. They fight for 24 hours and stuff, but they're left isolated and on their own. Now look to finish. I want to say a couple of things. Sorry, I know this is thing, but it's the whole German Revolution. It's quite difficult. Right so, uh, over it. The the the, the, fir the first thing is there's absolutely no guarantee that if the October re if, if the revolutionary action in October had carried on that it would have been successful. But there is an argument which goes round and round and round that actually there wasn't a revolutionary opportunity in 1923 and actually there probably wasn't a revolutionary opportunity for our, the, 1920, the early 1920s because the bulk of workers hadn't been one to communism, etc., etc. The truth of it is that every sign shows that in the summer of 1923 the Communist Party at least had a majority or there and thereabouts inside the working classes inside Germany and it had a, it had a good chance. It had a good chance if it was clear about the way forward, if it was clear about signalling that it was going to go for it and finally and, 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 and finally do it. The thing that held them back really was the failures of the past. 1921, the March action, the rest of it meant really the leadership had lost its confidence in itself. It was asking Moscow what to do on many cases. And I'm sorry, you can't organise the insurrection in London from Paris. You have to make your mind up where you are and stuff around it. So I, I'd argue clearly there was a, revolu a revolutionary opportunity. The second thing within that is you, sometimes you get these kind of meetings and say, well, the lesson of this meeting was that you should have organised a revolutionary party earlier, blah, blah, blah. The truth is, though, that's kind of true. Right stuff around it. What was the difference between the Bolsheviks and Luxembourg? Liebnik, Levy, Brandler and the rest of them is the Bolsheviks had managed to form some kind of a network of revolutionary socialists who worked independently together years before the revolutionary struggle. If you talk to lots of the participants and Brandler is one of them, that they, 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 their argument that we should have had some tighter network amongst the revolutionary left inside Germany is a really important process because at various times they weren't able to win the best workers to a political strategy despite their heroism and their commitment to the movement and the rest of it. Last thing of all, is this a history lesson? Well, to be honest with you, in October, or maybe later, we could have a, we could have a Corbyn government. Right, so we could have a left-wing Labour government. What would a left-wing Labour government face? It will face the IMF, it will face the World Bank, it will face the EU, it will face capital strikes, it will face hostile sections of the trade union leadership, it will face hostile sections of its own party. But a government in that position, if it starts to push against capitalism, if it starts to push against war and racism and the rest of it, will come up against exactly the same arguments that developed inside the German Revolution. So our argument in this situation is not that uh, the idea is to get a you know, wonderful sect of beautiful individuals who know everything and then douse the, the flames of those reformist fools who don't. But actually the lesson out, out of Germany is and stuff that revolutionary situations can emerge. They can emerge in very advanced capitalist countries and stuff around it. But you have to win an argument inside a section of the working class in an organised form in advance of the great events. And actually this is what we're arguing today. Somebody asked the other day, you know, why join the SWP? Because there's 150 people at meetings in Brighton and there's eight or nine in, in, in in, in, inside, inside Brighton SWP, why do it? To be honest with you, if, 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 if Rosa Luxemburg had had the effective capacity of having eight or nine in Bremen, she would have been going for it, right, and stuff over it. And so that our argument is and stuff, we work alongside people, we work all the lessons of the United Front from the German Revolution, of the open letter, the proletarian hundreds, the joint work, but without the revolutionary organisation, right, and stuff, you haven't got the punchline at the end when you need it.
want to say it's one of the best lectures I've attended in years. I mean, Michael done brilliantly there in a very complex and uh, complicated subject. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant lecture. It's really, really, really good, and especially uh, push for time to get all that in, and you did brilliantly. Um, I think it's one of the uh, few, uh, it's, it's little known actually amongst the uh, socialist ordinary people, and it's obviously uh, very, very important that we do study it in depth. And I think Michael's um, uh, activated my enthusiasm to find out a lot more about it. And I think uh, there must be a lot of richness uh, in the actual um, German Revolution 21-23 for us today, you know, because uh, Germany at that time was a um, fairly industrialized Western society compared to, say, Russia. So I think um, it would do socialists a lot of good to actually study the German Revolution in, uh, in depth. And, um, and also, like uh, Michael said, um, the, the kind of political situation now in the world in Britain is in kind of like um, in, in flux and stuff. And uh, the idea of like tactics and how you plan and how, orga how you organize. And I think there's lots of uh, richness within the German Revolution for like future tactics for socialists, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a question, really. Um, does the speaker think that if Trotsky had actually managed to go to, to, to Germany, had been allowed to go to Germany, you know, I understand he was prevented by Stalin, whether, whether that would have made a difference to the outcome of uh, the revolutionary situation in Germany? But and the other point, your last comment about um, the relevance to the UK, um, I mean, I, I don't agree. I, don't, I question that, because if you look at the situation in Germany, you had complete dislocation, disruption of, of, of the society. So the idea that <coughs> an advanced capitalist society like, like the UK, with a huge amount of st stability, could possibly be in a, a revolutionary situation, even if we had uh, a left-wing government under huge, huge pressure, um, I just can't see that happening. Any questions at all? Any? The floor is completely open. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps I can try and begin to answer that last question, uh, because that was a, that's a question often comes up, wasn't it? Sort of something about Russia being so backward, it was bound to uh, only revolution would work. Whereas in advanced Western countries, it's not possible. You have parliamentary democracy. People are far too wedded to that to think about uh, something like a revolution. Well, first of all, as far as Britain is concerned, we sometimes forget our own history. There have been certainly moments in the past where massive degrees of class struggle have put the ruling class in a panic. You go back to the 1970s, and it's one Tory minister said, I think in 1973, to his children, because of the high level of class struggle, enjoy your Christmas dinner. It may be the last you have. So it's not impossible, even in apparently very st uh, staid Britain for these kinds of things to be relevant. But th the more important point is this. Obviously in Russia, the revolution was possibly easier to get through because the things that propped up the state were relatively weak uh, and therefore you could have a revolution perhaps a bit more easily, but it would then be more difficult to have a social, uh, eventually to get to socialism, whereas it would be more difficult in a country like Germany where you had all these parties, uh, mass parties like the SPD wedded to the parliamentary system and therefore it was going to be a much longer affair. And that's really where the question of the united front comes in. How do you win people whose consciousness may be we want to fight in certain things but are still looking to leaders who have faith in the system? How do you begin to break those people from those leaders in a way that uh, works? You can preach at them, that's not going to work. You have to engage them in some kind of joint activity where they see for themselves that the revolutionary path is the way that's going to make the difference. And that's the lesson that was very slow, indeed too slow, for the German communists to learn. Now, people then say, well, you know, why couldn't they learn it? Well, partly, and Mark was touched on that, you have to start very early on if you're going to learn these lessons, because the Bolsheviks had something similar. They faced both pressures from the right and the left inside their parties. You know, the July days in 1917 in Russia, there was a huge pressure. Let's have the revolution now. Let's go for it. And Lenin and, and the Bolsheviks say, no, come 
someone we have to kind of hold back. Very difficult to do that unless you've built a presence that enables you to win the argument overall. You then have an argument about why should we support Karen- why should we support Kerensky against the, the German uh, against the um, army leader Kornilov the right before the revolution. He's a reformist. He's not you know he's nothing that we want to have. Again, Lenin and the Bolsheviks have to win an argument about this. But you do it if you built up that kind of thing. That's something that the German KPD did not have, d- hadn't had the time to do. They'd left it too late. Now, it's not to kind of criticize them. It's to say, that's a problem and therefore came back to haunt them in those periods. And what Michael says is that, you know, the problem was they didn't really learn these lessons. They kept on looking to Moscow. And, you know, if you do that, it's not going to work. It's a second thing that's important in 1923. By 1923, the common term was already, you know, getting pretty bad because, you know, there was a beginnings of the huge fight against Trotsky, against revolutionary ideas. And therefore, you know, whether... It, Maybe if Trotsky had gone, it made a difference. But the real problem was that kind of everybody was slowing down. I mean, the, the Russian leadership didn't kind of realize until far too late that there's a possibility in Germany. And then it became a kind of simply kind of a technical planning exercise to try and have the revolution. So all these kinds of things weighed. And I think what Michael finished on is important. We have a situation where things are building up. You know, who'd have thought two and a half months ago that we'd see the kind of situation we have now? Things can change very rapidly. We have to be able to relate to people who look to Corbyn, not in a way that's simply going to denounce them, oh, you're all reformist, in a way in which you build a kind of activity and a, a, so you win some of the arguments about how are we going to take on the state? How are we going to take on the real pressure that's going to be on them? And that's the kind of lesson I think we take negatively, so to speak, from the experience of Germany in 1923. It was absolute tragedy uh, because it did allow Hitler t- 10 years later to come to power. But if we learn the lessons now, we can stop that kind of process. You know, think that if we don't win this argument, there is a threat of kind of fascism and so on in terms of, you know, uh, possibility of growth we see around Islamophobia. We have to learn those lessons to be able to apply them. And that's the kind of hope that this kind of uh, meeting had. We learn that past in order to be able to apply it now. I think, I think, is this working? Um, I think the crisis in 1920s Germany was very, very acute and extremely visible. And that was you know, some time ago. I can't do the maths, but it was some time ago. And since then, capitalism has developed. And we've got longer crisis, stagnation, inflation, mass unemployment. We're almost used to living in a crisis. But it is, it is not... It's not stable. It is a stable situation of crisis. The ruling class can get out of any crisis if they can make our class pay for it. And for the past 30 years of neoliberalism, that's what they've been doing. And anybody can look at food banks, zero-hour contracts, homelessness, Grenfell Tower, and all the rest of it, and say anything at all about it not being unstable. We're living in this sort of long-term situation where our class is being hammered because the ruling class is organized, they're a tiny minority, they're organized, they're centralized, and they're ruthless, and they've been attacking us. And our leadership, sorry, on our side, has, their response has actually been sort of quite pathetic. There's been a massive buildup of anger against neoliberalism, and that's why Corbynism happened, because people at last had somebody they could vote for, and it's given outlet for that anger. That anger, anger didn't come from nowhere. It came from living in a period of crisis. It's longer than the acute crisis of 1923, but it is a crisis. I remember Harold Wilson standing and getting lots of votes for wanting to introduce reforms and making things better. He was left-wing. I don't know if he was more left-wing or or Corbyn, I don't know. But at that point, the the IMF, the organizations, the ruling class said, right, you do that, we're having a capital strike, we're closing it down, we're taking money out of Britain, now what are you going to do? And and what was Harold Wilson, what could he have done? What, What could he do? whistle up the working class to occupy the mines and the banks and all the rest of it. It doesn't happen that way. You have to be out there arguing the way forward, talking to people, winning small victories, winning people round to these sorts of arguments. Yes, we can win small struggles today and getting the confidence to win the big struggles tomorrow. It can't happen at the time when the IMF and, and the ruling class... You know, if you get a democratic elected government trying to storm the powers that be, their power does not live in parliament. Their power is in ownership of the means of production, their ownership of the banks, ownership of the mines. That is where their power is. 
and we elect a left-wing government, do you think they're going to say, oh, all right, then, gosh, you should have said before. Yeah, let's have an equal, fair society. No, they'll come for us with everything we've got. And the only strength we've got that stands a chance to stop them in their tracks is this power of organized working class. And if we're not out there winning people to that argument, winning struggles, winning people's confidence, then we're not going to get it. Yeah, first, first of all, on a question of um, uh, revolution uh, today in a different kind of situation in which we are. I mean, on the one hand, you can look at what, uh, what would happen to, if you want to know what's going to happen to a left reformist government, you can look at what's happening in, in, in Greece with Syriza. But secondly, the, I don't know, I don't think we've learned his name, actually, the general, that when Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party, said, we will resign, we will mutiny rather than follow the instructions of Jeremy Corbyn as prime minister. As, as, as Prime Minister, you know, the idea that he's going to be given an easy ride if he comes to power even on the back of a landslide election actually isn't, isn't, um, isn't, isn't what's going to happen. Um, and I just want to, want to come back to this thing about, you know, you have these small parties and stuff. By the way, we don't spend all our time in small rooms of six people. You know, we're able to put on events like this. And the reason we're able to put on events like this is because when we have those meetings, what are we always talking about? We're always talking about how do you connect with the wider layers of people around you. After Grenfell, how are we going to mobilise people around social housing? If there's a racist attack in your area, how are we going to put hundreds of people on the streets, organise a big rally, get everyone together, force the racist to back down? That is constantly what we're talking about and learning the history of uh, 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 of previous generations of fighters who've done that in the past in order to inform that discussion. That's a different sort of training. That's the training that we go through in the Socialist Workers' Party, both because it fits the situation now in terms of what needs to be done, but also because it's training for the future. It's like, you know, if you join the army, you go and do all this square bashing, you know, you've got to walk around, you know, march up and down. March. What for? It's totally pointless. They're just training you to obey instructions. That's all they're training you to do. Actually, in the SWP, it's a different sort of training because it's about training you to think, how do you connect with other people that don't agree with everything you say, but want to fight now? And how do you, at the same time, learn the lessons of history so that people are ready to, to, to talk about how you make an insurrection? And to do that, you've got to be ready to make decisions yourself. You've got to learn. This is why it's no good looking to someone in another country, why we're ready, come and tell us what to do. You can learn some basics about why you need independent revolution organization. You can't learn the details of the strategy and tactics. You've got to do that yourself. And that's why we're actually a different sort of party from the Labour Party, because that is how we organize ourselves, to do what's needed now by working with people, putting people on the streets, building the campaigns, building solidarity with the strikes, but actually training people in their self-confidence in order to lead the struggle from below. Um, there's a man in red teeth. Thanks, Michael, for a cracker of a meeting. Um, I, I, I used to say, as a sort of catchphrase, that uh, re revolution isn't the problem. Revolutions happen every day. Not every day, but a lot of the time you look around. History's dotted with revolution. Every political uh, and social arrangement which exists on this globe is the outcome of either revolution or war. Uh, and uh, so the, the, my little catchphrase used to be, yeah, yeah, revolutions, that, they're handy enough. It's, it's winning the fucking things that's the problem. And here, I think, well, and just look around today. Let's not be sort of, you know, little Englanders. Uh, there's a huge revolutionary uh, activity, a long, you know, you've, if you've been to the meetings the, and discussed the thing that's going on uh, throughout uh, the Arab world and so on, a, a long a long revolutionary crisis in all its phases and so on and so forth. And uh, therefore, I'm old enough uh, to remember when General de Gaulle flew out of uh, Paris to a German air base because it was brown trouser time. He thought he'd lost it. That was in 68. Uh, we've heard about uh, Wilson. We've heard about how uh, the, the, you know, the Tory thing that, 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 that Gareth uh, uh, talked about. So actually, revolutions do happen. And if somebody thinks that be, we are in some stable situation where you know, the old road can go on forever and ever, 
uh, you know, I mean, just look at the economic situation, the, the meeting that Michael Roberts did about how the rate of profits just banging along the bottom and it's, con you know, a continually difficult situation. So, therefore, these things, uh, and I'm not, no, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, well, next week, you know, there's going to be a revolution. That's the time to, to hit the barricades. But what I'm saying is that the notion that things can just go along on rails forever is not, it's certainly not what the real world we're entering. It's a much more shaky business, and we can see that every day in all the stuff that's happening. And therefore, when I say winning the revolution, when you look at the revolutions around the world and the uh, upheavals that happen, what do you long for? What do you really wish was there? That a current that had mass influence in the working class in those regions, which had learned some of the lessons that we discussed and so on, existed and was implanted and so on. Now, that takes time. That doesn't just occur out of the blue. And that's one of the lessons of the German Revolution. We need that current. We need to start today. We need to start yesterday. We need to continue on the process of what we've been doing all these times to build that current within the working class here and to learn our lessons. And it's going to be, it strikes me, I mean, Alex Klinikos said last night, and I think he, he ended his speech on it, which was a fantastic insight, a very important one, that the pressures on us with a credit, if there was a credible left uh, uh, Corbynite government, the most credible left reformist for uh, uh, since the Second World War uh, or, and beyond, if that comes to power, the you know, well, don't forget, but you know, even after you've considered all the uh, obstacles in his path, yes, uh, the the pressures upon us to liquidate ourselves into that will be enormous. And therefore, you know, you have to be able to operate as a minority but relate to a majority. And that's our task, it seems to me, for the, for the future. And therefore, if anybody says, you know, well, this revolution stuff, it's all very well for third world and backward places and all the bloody rest of it. No nonsense. It's, you know, I don't know what the time scale is, but this is, this is the inevitability. There will be revolutions. And the point is to be prepared. I don't know when they're coming, but be prepared and build now. Um, okay, there's a man in a grey t-shirt. Yeah. Well, I think, as already been said, really, the whole point of why we're having this meeting, while we're talking about the German Revolution uh, over 100 years later, is because it really was a laboratory for revolutionary strategy and tactics that every single, and, and it, you know, particularly that it did take place in an advanced capitalist country, you know, the, the biggest industrial power in the world, despite being in crisis following its defeat in, in World War II, a country with a, a mass uh, reformist party, a party with a mass trade union movement led by a very conservative uh, bureaucracy. And throughout the, um, you know, Michael's gone through it all you know, brilliantly to get it all in, but all the ups and downs, the incredible variety of situations that revolutionaries ha had to deal with it is, a, is a real something for us to learn from. Sadly, some of the lessons are negative ones, but I think it's really important that people do study this period, not as a historical exercise, but because it's so full of lessons for, for us today. And I think um, people should uh, read Chris Armand's The Lost Revolution, which is really a fantastic book, and there's another good one up here as well, but people should read that. It's very accessible. Uh, it summarizes very complex events very well and draws out the political lessons for us us, us today, really. And I think, you know, people can say, oh, Britain's completely different. Obviously, Britain isn't the depth of crisis that, that Weimar Germany was in. But nonetheless, as people have said, it's a very unstable situation. The ruling class are getting everything wrong. They've screwed up over Brexit. They've screwed up over the election. They're weak and divided. We're not clearly in a revolutionary situation, but the, the British economy is in a mess. I think there's all sorts of issues for the ruling class it's an unstable situation. It can get worse, and we've got to be um, look at the possibilities, not emphasise what's the, the negatives. And I think just to quickly go back to the um, some of the historical questions. I mean, it is true that um, Heinrich Brambler, you know, the leader of the KPD, was in Moscow drawing up the plans for the insurrection in September 1923. He begged for Trotsky to be sent out to Germany to lead the uh, to lead the revolution. Um, I think as a problem in itself, you know, if, uh, really, what it, was, it showed his, lack, his own lack of confidence. He, he admits it later on he was not convinced that there was a revolutionary opportunity, despite being the guy that's supposed to, to head it up. And, and that's why he wanted Trotsky, Trotsky to come out there. I mean, Trotsky, brilliant man, organized the October insurrection 
it, he doesn't have a magic wand. There's no substitute for 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 an organised revolutionary organisation that can react to events in a timely way. And I think there was a, clearly was a revolutionary situation in 1923. But I think I think it's arguable that by October the KPD had already missed the boat. The real opportunity was during the Cuno strike in August when through the factory councils, the KPD had led a general strike which had toppled the government. And that would have been, they should have been preparing for the insurrection before that. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. But I think they were a victim of their past, of the March action. You know, they were, they were conservative. They were, on, they were on a sort of defensive posture in July and August when they should have been preparing for the insurrection then. And that is the, the tragedy of the German Revolution. That they were uh, learning the lessons in the middle of the struggle, whereas people have said the Bolsheviks had, had 15, 20 years. They've been all through, through all sorts of different situations. They've developed a network, not only a network, but a, a cadre of workers who'd been through all the ups and downs of the struggle. They knew about the importance of Soviets. They knew, they'd experienced of arms in direction. They'd, uh, you know, they'd experienced lots of different things. But the Bolshevik experience did not directly transfer to Germany in some aspects because the Bolsheviks didn't have the experience of a, a mass, you know, mass reform, you know, mass reformist party to deal with and, and the trade union bureaucracy. So, so really it was down to the German revolutionaries to learn, learn things for themselves and that is the real tragedy. I know it's a cliche but it is the lesson of this meeting that we need to build a revolutionary organisation now so we've got the experience, we've got the, the, the base, we've got the things we need for when we have a British, a British revolutionary situation we won't go the same way as the KPD. Um, there was a lady in the best stop. Thank you. Hi, I wanted to um, sort of come back to what Sue was saying earlier a little bit, really, about mobilising and getting people on the streets um, and, how, and how we do that and our, what, what helps our ability to do that. And I think it's really, really important, as Sue was saying, about um, having a connection with the working class, having connection with mass movements, because if you don't have those roots, if you don't know where people are then how are you going to know whether people are ready to fight? If you don't, if, if, if you don't know, um, if you don't have roots in the working class, how are you going to know whether you can call a general strike or not? Um, and so that's really, really important. Um, how do you know what the correct tactics are to use if you're not talking to the people who are the best fighters in the movement? And really, I think, in the SWP, that's why we want to recruit the best fighters in the movement because actually they're the people that we learn from. That's where we learn our tactics from. That's where we learn where people are, where the movement is and where it needs to go. It's by speaking to the best fighters that we can get um, um, in the movement. And, and I think also now is the time really. Now is the time where we need to get those best fighters in, in and working with us because the scale of the attacks on our class at the minute are enormous. So you mentioned Grenfell, you know, the unemployment, you know, you could name, you can name hundreds of things, you know, that we're fight, trying to fight at the minute. And, and really, um, what we need is just to start the fight back now. We cannot wait until things get worse for people to join us. You know, we need to start that fight back now. We need to learn those lessons now. And we need people to join us now because we need to start, you know, fighting and we need to start learning those lessons. And the people that we're going to learn them from are the people that join us. So I would say if you haven't joined us, join us now and let's start the fight back. Um, okay, there was a man in a grey T-shirt at this side who ind indicated... I can't remember where you were, but there was a p someone at the back. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had a question for Michael, really, which was, I suppose, how do we relate? Because in, in some ways, we find ourselves in a similar, similar situation. We've got of course, to be relating to and responding to the Corbyn movement and momentum and all of the things that are sort of growing up there. But we also have our own sort of ultra-left people that we might be coming into contact with who were saying, well, look, the SWP, you say you're revolutionaries, but you're putting out papers where you're backing Corbyn, so we can't work with you. The Labour Party is a terrible thing. Everything needs to be got rid of. So actually, how do, how do we position ourselves and have that sort of nuanced political position and make it something that we can relate to the, the Corbyn movement but also have a response to that ultra-left movement. 
Ah, so now I see my pet. Uh, someone was at on this side in the grey t-shirt. You was it you, sir? Okay, right. Uh, we might have time for. Okay, you're going to be our last. Whoever. You can be our last speaker, and then um, I've got we've got a few announcements. Make it count. Okay, yeah, ju uh, just a small bit on uh, ultra-leftism in the common turn. Uh, going back to the March action, as, as, as Michael explained in the talk, uh, a completely misconceived idea uh, where the KPD um, tries to use its own supporters, uh, its own members and supporters, particularly amongst the unemployed, as a kind of shock troops to uh, uh, drive the working class into, into action. Uh, it fails and, and workers uh, uh, begin to see the, the KPD as completely ultra-left and so on. The ultra-left uh, drive comes from the common turn for, um, uh, by and large, and in part for understandable reasons of the crisis inside Russia itself. They want to kind of hasten the process, accelerate the spread of the revolution. Um, Paul Levi, uh, uh, Paul Levy is, is, is rightly uh, disciplined by the party for denouncing the uh, ultra-left action in, in his public, individually published, if you like, pamphlet. Um, and the ultra-lefts are then uh, vindicated to a certain extent and are triumphant at the uh, following Congress common turn. But a steadying voice uh, comes from within the common turn, which is Lenin himself, who actually holds separate meetings with the lefts who are now uh, 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 please, they've got rid of Levy, uh, uh, Paul Levy, and, and says, yeah, I think he presses for the smallest possible sanction, like he, he urges that he be allowed to uh, reapply for membership in a year's time or something like this, because for Lenin, the key is not an endless round of expulsions and uh, revenges as one side wins over the other side, etc., etc., but trying to unify effective left uh, party that can lead that can lead effective action. So the, the, the steadying hand comes out, and he speaks to uh, uh, people like Ruth Fisher, I think, um, and, and and tries to urge some form of reconciliation that can lead to uh, a mass party. Uh, had that had that been successful, uh, then who knows? The events of 1923 uh, might have been different. So I'm um, just going to pass back to Michael. We've got about. Five minutes or so to sum up. Okay. The first thing is the book plugs, right? It's favourite. There's Chris Armand's book, right? This is fucking brilliant, right? It's favourite. Chris Armand's book is brilliant, but this really is. It looks fat. Don't worry. It is a page turner. You could read this at the airport quite happily, right? It costs like 20 quid, but I would buy it personally if I had the money to do it again. But anyway, um, look, <laughs> it, it, it's the German Revolution by, I'll pronounce his name wrong because I can't pronounce anything. Pierre Brewe. Brewe? Brewe, yeah, right. It's, it is fucking amazing. But anyway, right, so, so that's the first thing to say. The second thing is, one of the things that comes across when you read the stuff over it, what is our idea, what are we told revolutionary parties are like? We're told they are top-down, we're told that they are, you know, hegemonic, that they've got one idea together and the rest of it. And actually, when you look at the arguments that were going on in Germany and the arguments that went on in the international, you know it's the exact opposite of that process, right? It's over it. There were huge arguments going on, because not because people just like arguing for the sake of it, but because they're trying to create a new society. And so, so therefore, in the German Communist Party, there is a continual crisis. There isn't a day when there isn't a crisis between the left, the right, the centre, and individuals who move between the two and stuff. The man who, uh, the man who takes over very, very briefly after... Uh, after Paul Levy, right, and stuff from before Brandner becomes leader, starts out as an ultra leftist, ends up leaving with Paul Levy because he agrees with Levy's position and stuff about it. And actually, in the international, it is not the case that Lenin and Trotsky turn up every now and again and get it right and hand down this great tone. There are huge arguments going on. People like Luxembourg and Leibniz and Paul Levy and the rest of them don't see themselves as people who receive orders from Moscow. They've been around long enough. They know. Uh, they think they know a site better. And Luxembourg, you know, shares. Look, many of Lenin's ideas. He doesn't share lots of Lenin's ideas. She rouses with him time and time. Again, Paul Levy doesn't go to Moscow as some sort of supplicant. He goes to put a fucking argument about what's going on inside the German Revolution stuff. And he's very critical quite often of the Bolshevik, partly because his argument is, and Lenin takes this up, Lenin talks about quite often the motions are, 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 are the Comintern are literally written in Russian.
Russian. No matter if you translate them, they're still written in Russian. Right? So because they don't understand quite often the kind of things that we are having to face in this kind of country. Mass trade union movements, mass reformist organisations and the rest of it. So the idea isn't that these things are handed down from on a high. The idea of the common turn is that it's supposed to be a school for strategy and tactics. And sometimes when it intervenes in the German Revolution, it's very, very positive. Sometimes it's disastrous. And when it intervenes around March 1921, it is a complete disaster. Why? Because because it is trying to force the pace. You can understand if you're in Russia after several years in government in a civil war and starvation and all the rest of it, why you want to force the pace. But actually the real point in this is and stuff, the revolutionary organisation has to be confident enough, yeah, to talk to other people and seek advice. But in the end, you've got to make the decision yourself. If you're in Wigan, Right, it's a favourite. Sometimes you might phone the centre and have a chat. But if the Nazis are going to move march through your town in two hours' time, it don't matter a shit what they think at the centre. You've got to make a decision yourself about how you're doing it. And if you don't know why the forces in the movement, and there are six, ten or twenty of you, you ain't big enough anyway. So you have to be rooted into a much wider thing. Second thing, just quickly, you know, there are no heretics inside the revolutionary socialist movement, right, stuff around it, right? Paul Levy might be one. Everybody should read Paul Levy's stuff. He was brilliant. The trouble is, he was, if you pardon my French, he was up his own arse a bit about things, really, and stuff, and actually quite often put his own kind of, you know, his own position and his own kind of moral stature above other things. What a lot of us have got to get used to. We know we have rows with each other inside revolutionary organisations, and sometimes, really, after a while, you've got to get over it. Right, so I don't mean if your noise has been, noise has been put out of joint, because the real point is what unites us is we have to go forward, and that's an important lesson. Sometimes you can be right, you can be right about things, but if you're obnoxious enough about it, it don't help. You have to try and talk through with our other comrades and take it forward. That is a very, very valuable revolutionary lesson. If, if Trotsky had gone to Germany, right, stuff, he's a great genius, blah, 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 blah. I don't believe that Trotsky turning up on his own would have made a blind bit of difference, right, stuff over it. He may have been technically good at the insurrection because he'd done one before and nobody else had done one that worked, right, stuff about it. But the real point, if the German communists themselves weren't convinced about the, about the possibilities of the revolutionary movement and stuff around it, then they were never going to be able to force the, force the thing through. And the problem that they had was that they were constantly zigzagging from previous mistakes, right, stuff like and if you make a big enough mistake, if you lose half your membership in an organisation of half a million workers, you start getting worried about your own judgment. And therefore, they were much more, feel much more confident about the United Front, the United Front, the United Front, which is completely correct, by the way. But at some point in the United Front, you're going to have to push it a little bit further, right, and stuff over it. And actually, when they did try to push it further, because they hadn't laid the bases strongly enough and stuff, they came unstuck. The last thing, really, was just about what the comrade raised earlier on. We don't believe that tom you know, tomorrow um, there'll be an insurrection ins inside Britain. Now, it's funny enough, if you think about the kind of atmosphere at the minute inside Britain, it is weird. You think about the stuff that's gone ar around Grenfell and other things. You know, actually, the night after Grenfell, it did feel insurrectionary in central London and stuff about, about it, stuff over it. But what we're talking about is a very, very volatile political period. Now, Germany, after the First World, through the First World War, of course, had suffered blows, but actually, Germany was probably the most, it was an absolutely stable society. This is what the politics of the SPD was based on year after year of economic growth, of slow change, of increasing democratisation, and the rest of the stuff about it, thrown to bits by war. We're now talking about a situation for the first time in generations where the anger inside British society has produced, on the one hand, Jeremy Corbyn, who can't walk down the road without being mobbed. On the other hand, by the way, there's a polarisation in some places to the right. Just look around the stuff around the Football Lads Alliance and the rest of it. Look at the attacks and the acid attacks and the rest of it that have been going on and the rest of it. In that situation, we have a clear thing. First of all, when somebody asked before, if somebody, as it's described, is a bit ultra-left and thinks just because you know, Corbyn's a, you know, crap and he's a sellout and blah, blah, blah. Well, to be honest with you, if you're a new person in a movement or you're a young worker or a young student, the rest of it, and you've got a bit of an edge on you, good on you. Because I, I, if you don't start out wanting to tear the head off everybody, write stuff over it, then you've got a problem. And actually, inside a communist international, they spent years, literally years, trying to win what were described as ultra-left elements, anarcho-syndicalists, other people, to the movement. Because they knew they wanted to fight. They were important people, so you had to take people seriously. The big thing, though, is how do you relate to the millions of people who are won by the idea that you can reform society, but in a radical way, which is what we've got with Jeremy Corbyn at the minute. The first thing, you have to stand 100% alongside those people. If what you really do is fold your arms and turn around and say, yeah, you're 
all right, Corbyn's all right now, but wait till he gets in. It's just like Syriza, he's a shit, he'll do whatever. So you'll get nowhere with people. Because also, by the way, history doesn't just repeat itself. A left-wing Labour government with a movement underneath it might be very different than what happened in Greece with Syriza or, or Holland in, in France. If you do stand alongside people week by week, defending your local hospital, fighting against the right, right stuff, working with people in the Labour Party or people who look to Jeremy Corbyn, you win the right to have a conversation. And the conversation is, come on, what's a favourite? It's brilliant what Jeremy's doing, but if you stick 650 Jeremy Corbyn's in Parliament, does the IMF go away? Does the EU go away? Does the World Bank go away? Does the Bank of England go away? Do the unelected courts and police and army and the generals who say they talk about a coup if he gets rid of Trident go away? No, they don't. So in other words, we can start to win an argument with a layer of people patiently talking through with those people right, and stuff about it. And actually, for all the faults of the, what the German, what happened inside the German Revolution, that's what the German revolutionaries tried to do. They moved from a position of thinking, I can seize power tomorrow, fuck it, to a position where they tried to win the majority of the working class. I believe by the summer and early autumn of 1923, they had won the majority of the working class when you look at the evidence on the on ground about it. And it means the possibility of revolution in that situation. And in an advanced capitalist country, yeah, very different from what we are now, but in an advanced capitalist country was there. And which people should look at the stuff around the German Revolution. Part of the problem we've got, and part of the reason we do things like Marxism, right, it's a favourite, is that we don't know our own history. We don't know our own history at all. And actually, we don't have to reinvent the wheel continually. Actually, what happened in Germany and the rest of it is very, very relevant to the situation in Britain. Last thing of all, people talk about it and stuff, but building up a revolutionary current now inside the working class, not separated off from the vast numbers of people who want to support Jeremy Corbyn and the rest of it, is a very, very useful thing to do. And that's why we go on at people about joining a party. Not because we're trying to build, you know, we get up to 101 and we get a prize or something like stuff about it, but because we think there is really a debate going on inside the working class. And as we all push forward together, if we build a strong revolutionary current now, we can be part of making sure that doesn't end in disappointment, but it ends in an increasing radicalisation and hopefully one day some fundamental social change. Yeah.